Hi, everybody. I'm so glad to see you all. And uh, I'm, I'm really happy to be with you. And uh, we have been doing this health talk with the amazing organization of Iranian American Community Center for six and a half, seven years. And it has been a joyful journey. It has been the journey of advocating health, prevention, prevention, prevention is my motto. Today, we're going to be talking about breath therapy. And we will expand this conversation. When we're talking about breath, we're all familiar with it. And we all know without breath, we're not alive. And I find it very suitable at this point to acknowledge the wonderful, blissful trees and greenery for providing us with the oxygen because without them, we could not be alive. And without them, we could not use the oxygen that they provide us freely with elegance, and with generosity. So the oxygen is what we need and that's why we breathe and we use the oxygen to build cells, build tissues and to do metabolism of what we have eaten. I think it's a great idea for us to start with a little practice of breathing. And this is going to take three minutes. And it's very meditative. And by doing this, we will all be putting our busy day behind, be prepared for this talk. For the first minute with these breaths, I'm sort of going to do a little bit of guiding breathing. And then the last two minutes, we will do it on our own. Deep breaths in, hold deep breaths out. Deep breath in. Hold, then deep breath out. Some of us may choose to close our eyes. That's an option.
In fact, truly, this is the way we should be breathing. From moment to moment, and if we do that, our autonomic nervous system will be regulated and our sympathetic and parasympathetic system will be dancing together harmoniously. Otherwise, we're going to have compromised oxygenation. And when we have compromised oxygenation, our brain, our whole brain will not get enough oxygen. And unfortunately, the part that is going to be deprived of oxygen is going to be our human brain, our frontal cortex, because more than our frontal cortex, we need our living centers, our cerebellum, the other parts of the brain have to get blood for us to stay alive. And then we do not breathe properly, our frontal lobe gets uh, the short end of the stick. And therefore we stay in our animal brain, which is not a very good place to be. Looking at the brain and the machinery in the brain, and this green area being our emotional centers are located here. I read in, um, a, book, in a book um, that in the 250,000 years that we human beings have been walking on our feet, unfortunately, for the most part, we have been using our uh, emotions to amygdala center. Amygdala is our animal brain. This is a very primitive place of our brain. And then we use this circuit continuously. This becomes the strong circuit. And the uh, neurons that wire together, they fire together. And then it becomes a habit. We just, from emotions, go to our amygdala. And we behave like animals, unfortunately. But the key for being a human, which we are supreme being, is for us to connect our emotion center to our frontal cortex, to our wisdom center, and understand that at the bigger scale, at any given time, everything is okay. But we don't do that. We jump from emotions to our animal brain and we think that it is Armageddon and there is no life left. And we act in a way that it's not uh, constructive for our living and for anybody else's who is in touch and contact with us. So basic health, meaning of health means balance. Without balance, there is no health. And without health and balance, there is no evolution. There is no maturity. There is no transcendence. And there is no ascension. We're going to get stuck in our blockages. And we're going to put ourselves in a box. And we're going to live in that box. Another concept of health is unity of mind, body, and soul. And the closest in our body to soul is our breath. And without our breath, we're not alive and we are soulless. Union of mind, body, and breath very beautifully happens in yoga classes. And I have experienced this myself personally. It's magical. You become one with yourself in yoga class if you do it mindfully, especially if you do gentle hatha yoga, not these power yogas and all that, that they play a music that really drives you crazy. But I'm talking about classic, genuine, Hatha yoga. 
So union of mind, body, and breath means health. So all of these things are indications for significant and important of health, the breath, sorry, breath and health. Now, when we're talking about breath, we might as well talk about the respiratory system or breathing system that is uh, starts from nose and hopefully we are nose breathers, not mouth breathers. Some people become mouth breathers, that's not healthy. From nose, it goes into the throat and then goes into larynx and then goes into the windpipe, which is the trachea. Then trachea becomes two branches and goes into each lung, right lung and left lung. And over there, the oxygen that has been carried into the lungs through the air gets transferred to blood and blood takes the oxygen to all of our cells and systems. This is cross section of the lung. This is the right lung. It has three lobes and the left lung has two large lobes. Inside the lung, there are, uh, this is trachea, these are bronchi and these are sub branches of bronchi and the smaller branches. And they all end up in uh, alveoli, which are chambers that oxygen gets transferred to blood from the wall of these house-like things. <clears throat> One thing that I would like to point out to here is the diaphragm. Diaphragm is a big muscle and plays a very, very important role in breathing. The movements of the diaphragm indicates the quality of the breath. If you're not moving the diaphragm properly, we're taking shallow and inefficient breaths. This is the diaphragm. It's a big flat muscle that divides the chest from abdomen. And there's only one hole here that the esophagus passes through and brings the food from esophagus to stomach, which is under the diaphragm. Going into lungs again, because when we're talking about oxygen and lungs and oxygenation, um, it's important for us to know that basically the function of lungs are to take the oxygen in, give it to the blood, and take the carbon dioxide from the blood and bring it to the lung and send it out with exhalation. Inhalation, exhalation, expansion of lungs, contraction of lungs, movement of the diaphragm downward, movement of the diaphragm upward, and effective breathing. What happens? We get oxygen, we detoxify our body and send the carbon dioxide out in the environment. One more diagram to show this. Lungs get expanded, diaphragm goes down, lungs get contracted and diaphragm goes up. Here air goes down, here air goes out. This is as simple as it gets. This is a bit more sophisticated. I'm not going to go into measurement of lung capacity. There are many different forms of lung capacity and it's usually done in the clinic by a machine called, um, basically is the, um, it, it measures the lung capacities. Uh, the thing that I would like to mention here is this blue part. The blue part, we call it dead space. What does it mean? It means that no matter how effectively we breathe, we cannot send this much of the air out, which is a significant amount. And therefore, we always keep some of the air that has carbon dioxide in our lungs, in our very best and efficient breathing. 
Lo and behold, if you're anxious and if you're not breathing properly, we just breathe more shallow and shallow. And oftentimes, our long movements are, are only this small. And over the course of time, we develop small space, inefficient breathing, and all kinds of lung problems. So proper breathing is really and really, really important. The test is called pulmonary function test, PFT. Pulmonary function test. You go to the pulmonary lab, they hook you to a machine, they ask you to breathe, then deep breathe, ex exhale, all kinds of maneuvers, and they measure all of these capacities. And based on analysis of that, they diagnose whether we have obstructive lung problem, restrictive lung problem, or sometimes we just have anxiety and we are not breathing properly. Why don't we breathe properly? Because we have very busy minds. We are multitasking and our mind and body and breath are not together. Our mind is somewhere, our body is in another place and we just don't breathe and we're anxious. And this is not unusual in work environments. These days it's a slightly better because people are working remotely but when you were in the office setting, most of the time you will be pulling your hair and you would get very anxious and you would not be breathing. Another problem is multitasking. When we are doing only one thing at a time, at the given moment, completely mindfully with presence of mind, it's fascinating how beautiful the results are. But when we are multitasking, our brain gets divided and divided and divided. We think that we are productive, but no, in long term, we forget something, we break something, we put something in the wrong place, and then we have to spend five times more time to find the thing that we misplaced, and then on top of that, go crazy. Or get into the mood of fight and flight. Fight and flight is survival methodology, is the function of sympathetic system. We are struggling. We're not calm, we're not peaceful, we're not breathing. In any given situation, we're fighting to win, or if we see somebody stronger than us, we're running away. This is all fear-based. Sympathetic system, it's all fear-based, unfortunately. And sympathetic and parasympathetic, we'll come to it in a little while. There are two branches of autonomic nervous system. One sympathetic is fight and flight, and the parasympathetic is the rest and digest. They need to be in balance. We cannot be resting all the time and we cannot be fighting or flying all the time. We need good portion of both for us to be balanced people. But when we go into the sympathetic overdrive, that's where the problem starts. When we go into the sympathetic overdrive, we're not breathing right. Our frontal lobe doesn't get enough oxygen. And the small amount of oxygen that our shallow breathings have provided our body goes only to vital parts of the brain to keep us alive. So we're only alive, but we're not living. These two concepts are very different from each other for us to only be alive or for us to be living. Now, going to oxygen and oxygen being needed for the correct metabolism in the body, we're all familiar with metabolism. Metabolism has two components to it. One is catabolism, the other one is anabolism. Catabolism means destruction, anabolism means construction. And destruction creates CO2, which is toxin, and we have to send it out by breathing. 
the construction creates energy and uses the energy to make proper materials, hormones, and cells in the body. And it's very, very complex cascade of events. But the one and only reason I put this here, for us to understand that building and destroying is an ongoing process in the body. Our cells are produced, but old cells have to die. Otherwise, body would not be healthy. And during the day, we continuously build cells and some cells die. Basically, it's just voluntary suicide of cells. Like the most clear example of this is our skin. We have dead skin cells that have to fall off for new skin cells to look fresh and hydrated and breathe properly. The same, exact same thing happens in every organ in the body. For example, red cells only live for 120 days and so on and so forth. All cells are regenerated and die. In other words, in a whole year, we have a new body. The cells that regrow the slowest are nerve cells. One thing is very important for us to know that we are what we eat. That is really true. And also it's very, very important to know that we become and we create what we feel and what we imagine then we attract those things. It's called law of attraction. So what we think we create, what we feel we attract, what we imagine we become. Here is the point that we really, 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 really need to live responsibly in eating, thinking, feeling, and imagining. These are fundamental things that alters our brain and alters the balance of our autonomic nervous system. Because if we create insecurity and imbalance in our body, our sympathetic and parasympathetic system is going to get out of whack, is going to get dysregulated, and we're going to go into survival mode. When we go into the survival mode, our whole body feels insecure, feels not safe. And on top of that, all the environmental factors, including aging, disease, pharmaceutical, air pollution, stress, diet, medicine, virus, bacteria, relatives, friends, whatever, 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 whatever when our body goes into insecure mode, what happens, we have increased free radicals. Free radicals are electrons that are not paired in our molecules. We, we see a molecule here, these are paired electrons. This one doesn't have a pair. This is free radical. By taking antioxidants, electrons go and repair the free radicals. So that's the significance of uh, uh, antioxidants. Um, small amount of free radicals is necessary in the body to contribute to those voluntary cell deaths that has to happen in the body. If we have a lot of free radicals, we're going to have DNA damage. And when we have DNA damage, we have unhealthy cells. We talked about the nervous system, starts with central nervous system, that is brain and spine, then peripheral nervous system, that is sensory and motor, that we feel and we move our extremities and our muscles, and then autonomic nervous system. That, the two main branches of autonomic nervous system is parasympathetic and sympathetic. They have to be in 
coordination with each other. Neither one should go into overdrive. And just a quick reminder, sympathetic is fight and flight, parasympathetic is rest and digest. And this is the anatomy of sympathetic and parasympathetic system, just to mention. When we come to breathing, and this diaphragm being the big muscle, the sympathetic and parasympathetic nerves play a very, very significant role because breathing for the most part is an involuntary action, but we can augment it and improve it voluntarily. The sympathetic nerve that moves the diaphragm is phrenic nerve. The parasympathetic nerve is vagus nerve. These days, you're going to hear this a lot, especially from functional medicine doctors, and they call it vagal tone. They call it vagus nerve exercise. How do we make the vagus nerve stronger? Because if we're living in a world that sympathetic system dominates, stress dominates, anxiety dominates, fear dominates, we need to bring overactivity of sympathetic system under control by activating our parasympathetic system, which the biggest representative of it is vagus nerve. And how do we do this? By deep, proper breathing, moving the diaphragm actively. Going back to sympathetic and parasympathetic system, which is really, really important in the mod body and its function is very, very important. But unfortunately, its establishment comes from our very primitive life, comes from animals, comes from hunters and gatherers time. This side is parasympathetic, this side is sympathetic. For example, then fear, or attack happens, the pupils will have to dilate for us to see our enemy. But when we're relaxing, we don't need that. Parasympathetic pupils are closed. Coming to saliva, when we are, we are attacked, we develop dry tongue. Our tongue is like a piece of wood in our mouth. Why is that? Because the message that the body gets is that, listen, it is it is famine. There is no food. There is no water. Don't waste your body water with saliva. Body keeps it because we think that there's no water. It's famine. And our tongue dries. Whereas when we are in a good shape, relaxed, our tongue is moist and normal. Going to heart. Heartbeat goes up. In parasympathetic, Heartbeat is slow and normal. For lungs, the same opposite effect. Dilates the bronchi, constricts the bronchi. I'm going to, although we're talking about lungs today, I'm going to focus a little bit on the stomach and sympathetic and parasympathetic system. The number of people who have acid reflux in America is a staggering number. Most everybody has heartburn. Why is that? Because we are in sympathetic overdrive and the whole GI system doesn't secrete much to digest the food. It also doesn't move properly. The motility slows down. So stomach balloons and acid refluxes and people develop constipation. There is backup and the whole GI system is not functioning properly. On top of that, the solar plexus, which is a nervous system that has a lot to do with energy movement in the body as well, develops problems in sympathetic overdrive. When we get to liver, when we're in sympathetic overdrive, again, body gets the message that there is no food. So do not use the glucose keep it and even produce some glycogen to increase the glucose, you're starting to have diabetes because of the stress. 
and then moving down to pancreas and bladder, similar situations. In sympathetic situation, the bladder has to become bigger and bigger because the person cannot go to the bathroom, has to hold it. Whereas when we are relaxed, we can empty our bladder conveniently. So what do we need to do? We need to think out of box. We need paradigm shift. What do I mean by paradigm shift? Paradigm shift means we need to shift ourselves from suffering to getting by and from getting by to flowing energetically to higher states of being and living. This slide is busy, but it's really full of meaning. And I'm going to spend about three minutes on this. Rest in peace, Dr. David Hawkins. He mapped the map of consciousness scientifically. And he has written many, many books, at least 12 books. And basically talks about the vibration and frequency of our cells and our tissues and our muscles and everything in our body. When we are stuck in our lower self, which is basically like hell, and the color is also red. In hell on earth, that sometimes we live on, we live in hell on earth, oftentimes we do. What are the feelings? Shame, guilt, hopelessness, grief, fear, desire, anger. And what's the vibration? 20 to 150 at best. 150 is below consciousness, below awareness. It's a really bad place to be. When we are here, we're not living, we're only alive. And our body is going through destruction, cat catabolic state is in sympathetic overdrive. We are divided, they're not united. They're in the domain of I, 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 me, 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 me. We are operating from lower self. We become very narcissistic. There is a spiritual collapse here. And at best, we are forceful. We are not powerful. We are forceful. Sickness lies in this domain. This is where we are sick in all kinds of forms and shapes. We have low energy, we're depressed, we produce bad hormones like cortisol, a lot of it, and at best, over-release of catecholamines that leads us to high blood pressure, diabetes, heart attack, stroke, and all of that. And we have very, very weak immune system. Talk about COVID era and weak immune system. We're asking for disaster. Now, the green zone is what I was emphasizing today, proper breathing and exercising vagal tone, oxygenating body, oxygenating our frontal lobe, our human brain, and using our free will, our proper decision make, making, because here, if we're not aware enough, if we make wrong decision, we're going to fall directly into the red zone. But here, if you make the right decisions, we're going to go upward. This is really, really, really crucial. When we go upward and when we bypass the getting by area, we have already developed courage, neutrality, willingness, acceptance. Here, we are on the right track. We're moving upward. We're going toward reason, wisdom, love, joy, peace and enlightenment and union with pure consciousness and totally being connected to anything and everything. So that's the beauty of presence, proper breathing, oxygenating the body. This is one way yoga breathings, we can breathe properly and calm our mind and this is another method of breathing. Breathe in for four seconds, hold for seven seconds, and exhale for eight seconds. That way, you're going to be pushing out some of the 
in trapped air in the dead space, and you are going to have more effective detoxification of your body. There's another methodology of breathing. It's called alternate nostril breathing. And this is also very effective. And uh, I, can pre I can demonstrate one. You block one nostril, breathe in and exhale. Then you bring the finger to the other nostril, open the other one, breathe in and exhale. So both nostrils have the flow of air, they get cleansed and they symmetrically work. This is called alternate nostril breathing. So to summarize everything that I said so far, we are aiming for well-being. When we are aiming for well-being, we are going to have a peaceful mind, a useful life, and an easeful body. No pain, no sickness. We are useful and our mind is peaceful. If we manage to have these three, we are doing well. And I so appreciate your being here today. Thank you. I'm going to stop the slides and I will open the forum for comments and questions. Thank you. Thank you. So if you have comments and questions, Please raise your hand and I will be glad to answer them to the best of my ability. Mehnush, you have